Please welcome Keenan Wyrobeck. Hi. I want to tell you a story about a woman named Alice. This is Alice. Two years ago, Alice went to her local hospital in Ramonda to give birth. Her labor proceeded normally and concluded an emergency C-section. Yes, an emergency, but a routine emergency. My son was born this way, scary, but routine. But for Alice, that's when the complications began. Alice started to bleed, but it was okay. They had her blood type in hand at the hospital, so they started transfusions. But Alice continued bleeding, and soon Alice was out of blood. This wonderful everyday event for Alice, everyday event for around the world, but every wonderful event for Alice, had turned life critical in minutes. And best case scenario, blood was hours away by road, but in the rainy season, it could easily have been days away. Four or five years ago, Alice probably would have died in the situation, leaving behind her son. But two years ago, she didn't die. Why? Alice's doctors placed an emergency order, followed by a second, followed by a third. In total, they, were, they received seven units of red blood cells, four units of plasma, and two units of platelets. That's more blood than you have in your entire body. It was all delivered in time. It was all transfused into Alice. And using that blood, Alice's doctors were able to stabilize her. And today she is alive and well, and her, and her baby boy has a mom. All of the blood that was delivered to Alice was delivered by a small autonomous electric aircraft we call a ZIP. After giving birth, Alice came to visit us, came to visit us, and had this to say. I used to see the zipline drone fly and people gathering around to watch. I would find it funny and think to myself, they must be mad, until the same drone brought blood that saved my life. The zipline story started three years before Alice gave birth, and it didn't start with the tech. It started by getting out into the world and spending a bunch of time getting to know people. We spent a bunch of time in Central America and Africa listening and meeting people. And we heard the same story over and over again told in different ways about how people's healthcare was getting stuck by this very unsexy problem, logistics. Doctors share, with us, doctors share with us their torment at losing patients they knew how to save, they knew the treatments, they just couldn't get the supplies. Now there's a bunch of factors that all come together to create this problem. We asked doctors to forecast their supply needs months ahead of time and then deal with a medical emergency you could not have predicted hours ahead of time. Lack of bridges means you're driving along. What you think is a creek you're going to drive through, now it's an impassable river. We're sending things like blood and vaccine that require refrigeration to parts of the world that just don't have reliable electricity. Traffic gridlock can turn a city into a parking lot. Now, at this point in our journey, we're starting to understand the problem well enough that we're convincing ourselves we could probably fix this problem with a drone-based logistics system. But there was a much bigger question that was making us nervous, and that was how could we actually design a system that would work practically in the real world at meaningful scale to make a dent in this problem? That's when two things happened. First, that's when the government of Rwanda enters the Zimpline story. They took a huge chance on us. They started working with us before we had a prototype that could even fly. And second, our team, working together with the government of Rwanda, from the very beginning of our design process, we worked together, counting on their data and their feedback for each critical decision. I know for a fact that we would not have a useful system in the real world today if it wasn't for this collaboration. Because our assumptions, well, a lot of, largely my assumptions, I wasn't one of the founders, we were just wrong about what we needed to build. Let me give you two examples. When we started, we were very proud that we had designed a drone that could deliver anywhere in a 20 kilometer service radius. And then we got data on where the paved roads ended relative to the locations of all the hospitals and clinics we needed to serve. Well, and it just became obvious, 20 kilometers was useless. So we redesigned for an 80 kilometer service radius. Another example, when we started, I convinced myself and so did our team that we didn't need to design a drone that could fly through storms if we could deliver just before a storm and just after it cleared but it was being in the real world, getting to experience firsthand what it's really like to operate as doctors, and it made it just obvious that we had to design something that could fly through storms. So we did. Today, Zipline is the largest autonomous system of its kind in the world, and I'm confident we are only at this scale because of this collaboration and design.
Now, collaboration and design is not some new idea, right? This is product design 101. <laughs> Customers first, now you have committed users. Put those committed users at the middle of your design process, iterate with them, and if you're really listening, you end up with something amazing at the end. But so often in tough tech projects, well, this just isn't done. I think there's a lot of reasons for it, and there are good reasons. One of the biggest reasons is that, well, in tough tech, almost by definition, you have a lot of users. At Zipline, we think of our users as first, anybody involved in your value chain, okay? Hopefully you're providing some value at the end. This is people inside, outside your company, manufacturing, supply chain, any type of operator, any type of maintenance tech, anybody involved in actually delivering whatever it is you're gonna do, providing that value day in and day out, plus anybody involved in the purchasing decision, especially anybody who could scuttle that decision like a regulator. Now, this definition is expansive, and we think of it this way, right? If there's anybody who late in your design process could introduce something that might cause a reset you can't recover from, think of them as a user and bring them in early. <laughs> when we started five years ago, this was, a, well, let's watch, hold on a sec. Well, let's watch a video on Zipline first and then I'll keep talking. This is what we do. So everything you saw in that video was the result of five years of this collaboration design, every detail. And I like to sort of think backwards from the finish line, right? To motivate why it's so important to focus on this collaboration design early. So the finish line, to be clear, zip line's not quite there yet. The finish line, you have, you have something, it's in the real world, it's economically viable, everybody wants it, now you just gotta scale it and you have a successful business. Before that, you gotta bring all your users into the process, get their data and their feedback early enough that you can actually do something about it. That can take years. Before that, you have to discover all your users. That can take years. And then you have to develop relationships with them that are deep enough that they'll actually work with you in the design process. That can take years. So today, Zipline's more than five years in. Well, and we're still learning from our users and we're still discovering new ones. When we started five years ago, we were very excited that we had a simple list of users. This is that list of users, right? Airspace regulator, the health system, our customer, the people who hire us, the doctors who are sending on-demand orders to all day long, and our internal users, manufacturing and flight operations. So, well, this was naive. This was, this was way oversimplifying the problem. When we launched in Rwanda three years ago, this was our list of users. And I'm not gonna talk about all of these, but let's just, as an example, talk about the regulator. We thought we had one. We had to work with six regulators to launch in Rwanda. Started with the United States Department of Defense. They had to not classify us as a cruise missile. So, then we worked with the Department of Commerce to get export licenses and to arrange, well, all of our engineering to be export compatible. We had three airspace regulators. The Rwandan Air Traffic Control Organization. These are the people who run the airspace day in and day out. The certifying agency, the RCAA, they're the ones who actually like look at your tech and your operations and sign off or not. And when you're flying a national scale drone delivery system in a country like the United States, it doesn't allow that kind of flight, flying of drones and you're flying over sensitive areas, you better believe the Department of Defense has to sign off on that airspace integration plan. And finally, we're, we, deliver, we started by delivering blood, and so we had to comply and get certified to an international standard for both of our facilities, our operators, and our operations. There are, of course, stories behind all of these users, and to be clear, some of these are really groups of users, where if we had learned what we learned from that user too late in the process, it would have killed Zipline by now. I'm just sure of it. So, well, there's a lot of reasons why you make excuses about, like, the tech is hard enough, I'm gonna work on the users later. And separate from this argument I'm making about avoiding this, re this catastrophic reset, getting introduced or late in your company, bringing your users into this design process early from day one, in my, in my experience, strictly accelerates your development and saves you money in two key ways. Nothing motivates your team, your engineers, like having a personal connection to the people who are gonna use their tech. 
I have, I've come to believe this is like fundamental human nature thing. This works on even my most agoraphobic geeks. And in tough tech, your development timelines are really long, right? And so having this intrinsic motivation is really valuable for, to, for that sustained period of time. Now, the second sort of accelerating factor, this is one's, well, it might feel a little bit subtle, but it's, it's just so powerful. The second accelerating factor, right, in, in, in tough tech, you have, well, there's so many things you have to do. And it's so critical that each thing you do is as elegantly simple as possible. No more, no less. And having your team grounded in the experience of the users means that your team's debates about what can be cut and what can't, what's elegantly simple and what's not, those debates are grounded in reality. And that is innovation magic. I love it. I, part of the reason I love coming to give talks is now I get to go back in a few days and see all the innovation, literally that I can measure it in days. It's really cool to see when this connection is strong. So my, <laughs> to connect my talk a little bit to Rod's here, my motivation um, and my focus on this collaboration design, well, started early in my career when I face planted hard. Before PR2 and Ross and Willow Garage and later Zipline, I started a company called Neato Robotics. And we set out to create a robot vacuum cleaner that would create a better, a better cleaning experience than the iRobot Roomba. Now eventually, <laughs> now eventually that Neato shipped that robot and it's doing fine. But that robot that shipped started a year after I left that company. And I am confident that what I did never saw the light of day because we focused on the tech first, not the user first. It's great tech, but it doesn't matter to the user. So that was my wake up call, and now I live by this maxim. It sounds a little goofy, but it really works for me, right? If you imagine a solution to a problem, you change the world. But if you imagine the problem, you waste your life, <laughs> right? You imagine the problem, you are not only incorrect in your imagination of the problem, but you're incomplete. But if your team and you are grounded in that experience from your users, well, now you actually understand the problem, and now you're solving a real-world problem, not an imaginary one. So let me make this a little more concrete by bringing this back to Zipline and talking about one of our operators, our flight operators. So when we started five years ago, we didn't have any flight operators. We didn't have anything to fly. And so we connected with the people doing the world's largest long-range drone delivery operations in the world, the United States military. We talked to their flight operators. Now, I do not mean that some leader in our company or some product leader went and talked to these operators and brought back some requirements. Our whole team spent real time building relationships with these flight operators. It took real time to learn from them and listen and learn some more. And we learned a lot of things that have materially affected us. We learned, you know, what is it like on those one in 100 days when shit hits the fan and everything's going wrong and it's storming outside and you still have to operate safely? You know, we learned, you know, even in a, how in a disciplined organization where everything has a process, everything has a checklist, how does user error still slip in? We got to understand why so many drone systems, especially the big drones, take 12 operators to operate one drone. And then when we got started with our development, it was just like magic. I got to step back and see my team from the very beginning, working on the biggest risks in our program. In the very beginning, they were leapfrogging and better yet, sidestepping so many of these issues they had learned from these operators. Two years later, when we actually had a drone that we were starting to fly a lot, we doubled down on this connection between our engineers and our flight operators by co-locating the two teams at our test site. Now, this is a little weird. It's hard to recruit world-class engineers to work in the middle of a cattle ranch, but it works. When your users are grounded in the experience of your users, the magic just happens. And today we have the most operable long-range drone system in the world by every key metric. We have one pilot flying 16 zips today. We can turn one of our zips around in just minutes, including a rigorous pre-flight check. Last week, we just hit 2 million kilometers flown in the real world, de delivering vital medical supplies. And just as importantly, in all of that operation, no one has been hurt by a zip. To understand Zipline's impact sort of on healthcare, you have to understand blood. So blood is first precious, very rare. I mean, it's always in short supply. It's more expensive than you think. There are many different ty blood types, some of which, again, are very rare. So there's one key metric that all public health systems track. And that metric is how much of their blood supply expires on the shelf before it can make it to a patient. Western countries, we spend a lot of time and a lot of money to achieve waste rates like this. Now, Rwanda, working with Zipline, 
over the 32,000 units of blood that they've delivered, they've achieved a waste rate of 0.07%. Now, this is a really big improvement, but still, let's talk about its impact on health. And to do that, we talk about maternal mortality. Maternal mortality is when a mother tragically dies from complications due to childbirth. Complications of childbirth is the largest use of blood in the world. In a recent study that, looked, that studied two hospital zipline serves over a seven month period, Rwanda achieved a maternal mortality rate of zero. And that is a very good number. And these are some of those mothers to whom zipline has delivered blood, blood on demand, right? What's needed, when it's needed, where it's needed. So this is Rwanda. You can see our two distribution centers there as well as all the hospitals and all the clinics that we are currently scaling to serve. Earlier this year, we started operations in Ghana. We have two distribution centers running today, and in a few months, we'll have two more, and that will bring 12 million people in Ghana within range of on-demand medical deliveries. So that's where we are today. Well, what's next? When we started operations, it took us six months to have flown the equivalent of once around the equator of the Earth. We didn't fly around the equator of the Earth, but add them all up. Today we do that every week. By the end, in a few months we'll be doing that, oops, I'm sorry. In a few months we'll be doing that every day, and by the end of next year it should be every hour. But even at that scale, we'll only be serving 2% of that global mission. And so we obviously have a lot to still develop and a lot to reimagine to actually enable global scale for ziplines operations. Everything from the doctor experience to re-architecting our airspace for this dramatic increase in the number of zips to developments like a perception system that working with the FA on right now that will enable us to fly in airspaces that are currently off limits to us. As we think about reimagining everything that we need to reimagine and developing everything that we, need be, we need to develop, there's one thing that we hold sacred, one thing that we just like know for sure, and that's that we're gonna design it all hand in hand with the people we serve. Thank you. <laughs>